Welcome back. This is part two of an interview with Walter Bayer about the presidential elections in Austria and the rise of the far right in Europe. Walter Bayer is an economist and the coordinator of Transform Europe Network. Walter, thank you again for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure being with you. So, Walter, elections throughout most of Europe in the past three years have shown an increasing share of votes going to the far right political parties that we didn't expect to have this kind of prominence in Europe. Um, what is this increase in the far right's popularity uh, have to do with? Well, you're rightly saying that this is something which does not concern only um, particular countries or a particular region of Europe. This is a European-wide trend. Uh, the six best-performing far-right parties uh, come from all parts of Europe. From the north, you have Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland. You have Switzerland, which is a neutral country in the center of Europe, you have Austria, then you have France uh, in the west, you have the UK in the north. So you see, this is a European trend, uh, which is the expression, and here it is the same story as uh, it is in the Austrian case, which expresses a deep frustration and discontent of uh, large segments of the society with the state of democracy and with the social and economic conditions in which they are living. Our surveys show this, and they show it throughout uh, the last two decades. But what is new now is that this feeling of frustration about uh, democracy and about the way how things are handled in our states uh, coalesced uh, with uh, the economic crisis and uh, with impoverishment uh, of uh, large numbers of people, of deprivation of parts of the working class, and <clears throat> pardon me, and with an increasing fear of those segments of the society which still are living in uh, better and consolidated conditions, that even their conditions um, will deteriorate so that they then uh, will be uh, put in a state of uh, precariousness. And the, the um, uh, leading parties, the big coalition of the leading parties uh, on the European level, which are the conservatives, the social democrats and the liberals, uh, show and demonstrate that they are either not willing or not apt to cope uh, with this situation as they are um, more or less engaged uh, with employing policies of austerity, of uh, downgrading social and uh, welfare state uh, arrangements and so on and so forth. All things uh, which frighten and scare people. And um, this leads to a polarization. It's not uh, unilaterally so that uh, this, uh, this content is only articulated by uh, far-right parties. Uh, if you look into the electoral results in 2015, you could say that 11% uh, uh, of the voters voted for uh, radical left parties as Syriza, as Podemos, and a um, number of other parties, but 22% uh, of the voters voted for far-right parties. So we see an asymmetrical polarization to the detriment of the political center, which rightfully is uh, held responsible for the deterioration of the social, economic, and political situation in Europe. Now, um, you argued in a panel you were on at the left forum that there's a real crisis in democracy uh, in Europe. What did you exactly mean by that? Well, uh, democracy, um, to a large extent, is, it is and was followed throughout uh, the, the last decades. And uh, there is the authoritarian turn in the European institutions with which the European Union tries to cope with the economic crisis. However, as long as people had the feeling that things are going 
well for them as long as real wages increased and um, unemployment rates remained low as long as um, uh, labor uh, relations seemed to be stable. Uh, this did not result in tremendous shifts uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the political system. But nowadays, uh, the decline uh, of um, the European economies and the, um, the decline of the welfare state uh, uh, arrangements uh, changes this. And now people lose trust in democracy because they see it doesn't matter whether you vote for Sarkozy or Hollande. Both of them uh, employ the same policies, the same policies of cuts. People feel not heard and taken seriously. And this results in a decline of trust in democratic institutions as such. And this is articulated by the authoritarianism um, promoted uh, on the part of the far right. Walter, the rise in nationalist parties and, uh, and far-right parties is certainly gaining momentum in Europe altogether, if you tally it all up. But also in specificities, as we mentioned earlier, in places like Switzerland, France, in uh, Hungary, uh, and so forth. Um, what are the political reasons? You defined some economic and social conditions, but what are the political reasons for this kind of a rise in the right? Uh, I would distinguish um, um, with regard to the political reasons be between uh, that what uh, I describe as the crisis of democracy, which is um, a domestic issue, namely people don't trust their governments and don't trust the political parties in place. But at the same time, and this is relevant to understand the phenomenon of uh, the rise of nationalism uh, in Europe, uh, you also have to see uh, the crisis of legitimacy of the European Union, which is uh, a currency uh, union, uh, uh, economic union, uh, now uh, characterized to uh, a harsh austerity policy, which is detrimental to the social situation of millions and millions of Europeans, creating mass unemployment, youth in, uh, unemployment, and so on and so forth. But it's also a specific uh, arrangement of national relations in Europe. And nationalism is actually questioning this arrangement of the national relations in Europe. And this has to do with the fact that the European Union is not transparent. Uh, it's not at all democratic. The European Parliament can uh, not be um, called a fully fledged parliament as it doesn't dispose uh, of uh, the right uh, to initiate uh, laws. And then uh, what the crisis, uh, what, what the Greek crisis showed so dramatically was uh, that um, not all member states of the European Union are equal. Uh, there are the big ones, France, Germany, and then particularly Germany was its role. And then you have the small ones who, who have more or less to accommodate to that what the big ones decide on behalf of them. And this creates uh, a feeling that uh, Europe is not working in service neither of uh, social security, nor of economic prosperity, nor of solidarity, and neither of uh, democracy. And I guess that this is, I sense that this is the deepest source of the growing nationalism in Europe. And uh, the decline in popularity of social democratic parties in Europe, what is that due to? Democratic parties started off uh, to represent uh, the working class and um, the welfare state compromise um, for which the Social Democratic Party stand uh, actually said, well, we do not any longer strive for socialism, but at least we guarantee or a certain level of social security. We guarantee that your wages uh, are uh, rising gradually, of course, 
uh, the richer become that the rich become richer, but at the same time, uh, the mass of the population can be sure uh, about the future. And this is not longer the case. So uh, what's the use of a social democratic party who is not anymore representing uh, the working population? That's the question which people of the world uh, of the working population are asking themselves, and then they say goodbye to the social democratic parties. And then the second issue, the, the second um, argument in this respect is that uh, social democratic parties always uh, stood for um, a certain, I would say, um, very general and maybe not sufficient, however existing, class consciousness, uh, they, and the, they stood for uh, the interpretation uh, which many people uh, in, the, in our population shared, that there are uh, upper classes and lower classes, and the lower classes have the only thing which they have uh, to defend themselves were trade unions and were solidarity. And this idea actually has been abandoned by most of the European Social Democratic parties. But if there is no solidarity within uh, among the lower classes, uh, then parts of the lower classes start turning against each other. Then certainly people find out, well, there are the migrants, there are the teachers, there are the public servants who take money away from us. And this is the fertile ground for um, right populist uh, argumentations, which now are gaining ground in the working populations of our societies. Walter Bailly, I thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to have you back very soon. OK, thank you very much for your interest. See you soon, hopefully. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.